Um, I guess you've all been, uh, been sitting down all day. So, to start, I would actually like you all to stand up. Ah, oh, yes. You've been sitting a long time, right? Okay, good. Okay. I want to show you what you can do if you know something about the human mind. Okay, I want you all to uh, put your hands out like this. Put your thumbs up. Clap once. Very good. And put your left hand up. Left, yes. Okay. Um, thumbs down. This is way too difficult, I think. Okay, put your hands over each other and interlock them. And now the important part is that if you did it right, your left thumb should be up, right? Some people trouble. <laughs> your left thumb should be up. Okay. Uh, put your uh, index finger out. Okay. Now, if you all did exactly what I did, you would all be able to do this. You can all sit down. <laughs> okay, online persuasion. Um, this is what we'll be talking about next half hour. And um, this is a nice definition of uh, persuasion by BJ Fogg. An attempt to change attitudes, behavior, or both, but we're not trying to coerce someone into doing something he doesn't want. We just want to help them make the right choice. Um, and to put it in a bit perspective, if we talk about psychology and persuasion, we want to increase motivation. And when we talk about usability, we're talking about decreasing the bumps in the road. So we need to do both. Um, I was... Uh, when you're walking in a street in a big city, probably also uh, here, um, at least it is in the Netherlands and in uh, a lot of states, um, when you're walking in the city, someone is asking you for money at some point in time. They want a donation, they want to sell a newspaper, they want to sell a magazine, uh, they want a, a, a subscription to, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a good uh, animal care, health care or something. Uh, someone at some point wants some money from you. Um, I had the same thing. I was in uh, uh, San Francisco uh, last year uh, to get an award from uh, John Donahoe from uh, eBay for my uh, uh, Me Magento organizing and, and d creating a Dutch Magento community. Has, has nothing to do with the presentation, just like to show off. Um, <laughs> so I was in San Francisco w walking down the street and indeed, uh, some guy stepped up to me. And I was walking there, I'm not sure where to go, so he saw me wandering, wandering around. And um, he was probably homeless. And he was starting to give me some advice. He started giving me advice on where to go, where to go shopping for, uh, to get a gift for my girlfriend, uh, where not to go when I was walking out uh, late at night, don't go into the dangerous neighborhoods, uh, where to get some good food. And um, so he was providing value to me. Um, and after five minutes of very pleasant conversation, he asked me, uh, could you give me some money to get to the other side of town? And I actually, I felt glad that I could give him something in return. Uh, he gave me a lot of valuable information, I needed that at that time. And he, he provided me with that information and I could give something back. That was great. And that's what persuasion is all about. Giving something of value to someone that is uh, needing that uh, information at the right, right time. Um, so you didn't come here for me, but uh, to let you know where it's all coming from, I, I studied psychology uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I did a lot of work with uh, Joomla, I uh, also created a community around that, uh, but I liked e-commerce much more, so I switched to Magento in 2008. Um, I also organized the Me Magento events in the Netherlands, 
Uh, and I currently work at Online Dialog, which is a company that's uh, trying to increase uh, um, conversion at companies. Uh, we do a lot of research. Uh, we use that research in psychology and uh, uh, web analytics to optimize the websi websites of our customers. And we also focus on the process behind the optimization. So we also train teams, optimization teams, uh, at our uh, customer offices. Uh, yeah, and if you want to find me online, <laughs> somewhere. <coughs> um, so this is the presentation. It contains of three parts. Uh, a little bit of theory, a little bit of practice, applying that theory on e-commerce, and the future of e-commerce where I think we will be going in the next few years. Um, you have a big problem. As an online merchant, you have a really big problem if you look at the uh, conversion rates. And to make sure that, we, that we're on the same page here, if you divide the total number of orders by the total number of visitors, uh, you get uh, to a conversion rate. So if you have 300 orders, 20,000 visitors, you have a 1.5% conversion rate. Um, if you com compare conversion rates offline and online, there's a huge difference. Um, th these are numbers for uh, fashion. Um, offline, 20 to 25 percent of people walking in a store buying something, but offline this number is much, much lower. Um, here are some numbers for, for other branches. Uh, on top, professional services and banks, 10 percent conversion. Um, and we have e-commerce retail down here. Here are some examples of good conversion rates online. Uh, Amazon. Staples is the, the office supply. I don't know if you have it here. It's uh, office supplies. Um, they obviously sell flowers. 14.1% conversion online. That's huge. Um, and we have Schwanz. Um, they're, an, uh, they're an online uh, supermarket, and they have a lot of returning uh, visitors, return uh, customers. But s still, if you compare this number with the number of people walking away from a supermarket without a bag of groceries or whatever, it's almost 100% at a regular supermarket, right? So still, compared to offline, there's a huge difference. So we have a problem. Why is this? We have a lot of issues online that we don't have offline. Um, to give you some ideas, uh, you can smell a product uh, offline. That's really nice. You can do that online. You have direct feedback. You can fit your next trouser or shirt or whatever. You can try it on. There's no commitment. Um, you, you don't see people offline throwing all kind of uh, products in, a, in their basket and then leaving it at the desk and just walking away without paying. People don't do that offline, gladly. Um, but they do that offline, online. Um, and personalization is really hard online. Uh, we're getting better and better at it, but offline, if you're buying cheese uh, at the store of this man for the last 30 years, he knows what you like, he knows what wines you like, um, uh, what cheeses you like from what, what countries, and if something new pops up, he knows if it's a good fit for you or not. And that's hard to do online. So there's a solution. Uh, this is an old picture of me. Um, but our decisions, decisions we make every day uh, are largely unconscious. Uh, and the scientists, they disagree on the exact number, so 90, 95, 99%. The way you dress yourself, the way you walk, uh, uh, the way you uh, take a shower, the way you drive to work, you don't consciously need to think about it. Gladly, that's a good thing. We have shortcuts, we learn uh, how to do things, and we make shortcuts in our brain that we can just do stuff without thinking. And these are some, some of these shortcuts we have in our brain. When something is expensive, we expect it to be of good quality. Someone's wearing a white coat, he's probably telling the truth. 
it's probably a doctor. When we get more for the same amount of money, that's probably better. If some, um, someone's telling you, well, I'm doing this and this because it's probably a good reason. When we put something on eBay, we polish it before we put it on so it looks better, newer. When it's beautiful, it's probably more user friendly. Apple is misusing this one. When it's unknown, we think it's a bit creepy. Uh, and when it's familiar, it feels a lot more safe and secure to do something with it. And like I said, it's really a good thing that we have those shortcuts in our brain. We, have the, all the, we don't have the time and knowledge and resources to make really educated decisions about everything uh, we do and how we drive and how we sh uh, tie our shoelaces. We don't. It's really great to have those automated thoughts. And we call you can forget the term. We, we call it heuristics uh, the, and intuition, common sense, whatever. Uh, but these leads, and, and most of the times, those automated uh, thoughts are really great and really helpful, but sometimes they, they lead to a cognitive bias. You're biased to do something in a certain way that helps you maybe 95% of the time, but it's not always true. Um, and we can try this. Um, the availability heuristic is about how easy it is to recollect something in your mind, how, e how easy it is when the last time something happened. Um, and here I have four quite uncomfortable situations. Um, and these are, they all stand for a certain situation. We have a situation, uh, all the casualties worldwide from uh, terrorist attacks, all the casualties worldwide from airplane crashes, uh, all the casualties from any natural disaster worldwide, hurricanes, whatever, uh, and all the casualties worldwide from a swimming pool. And if I would ask you, and I, I do this presentation more often, if I would ask you which one doesn't belong here, you'd probably say the swimming pool, right? Uh, anyone wants to say why? Why doesn't the swimming pool belong in this picture? Doesn't look bad, huh? Sorry? Very dangerous, the swim pool. Exactly. Yeah, you're both right. And that's exactly what you, what you said. It, it, when someone dies in a swimming pool, unless it's, of course, if it's family, then it's a totally different story. But when, when someone dies in a swimming pool, it's probably, most of the time, it's just one person. And you don't hear about that, in the, 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 you don't read about it at the, in the newspaper, they don't put it on the news, because it happens so often, and it's just one person. But if an airplane crash happens, uh, there are a lot of people involved, and it doesn't happen that often, so it's newsworthy. Uh, then you see that our, uh, the automated thoughts we have are influenced by our experience and uh, they're not always correct. They help us a lot of the time, but they're not always correct. Um, try to answer a math question and try to answer it quickly. We have a, a bat and a ball. Together they cost $1.10. The bet is one dollar more expensive than the ball. How much dollar is the ball? Most people would say um, 10 cents, but it's not. It's five cents. We suck at math. Try it again. Quickly guess the outcome of the next calculation. Just guess. Most people would say, on average, 512. I have another one for you. Try to quickly guess the outcome. You already know what's happening, right? 
on average, people think is 22.50. Um, so this also shows that the way we present items also to our customers online, the way we present customers uh, is important on how we perceive it. It's, of course, the same sum, and um, the actual answer might be even sh more shocking. Uh, we really suck at math. Um, but the order in which you present things uh, make a different, uh, make customers look at it differently. So, the theory, we have a big difference between online and offline conversion. We have many cognitive biases, uh, and that's good, but we're not always aware that we have them. Uh, and we, as online merchants, uh, we can use that to influence uh, behavior. And that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, these are the six weapons of influence. Maybe you've heard of them. Uh, Robert Cialdini, uh, he wrote a book about them. Um, and his book isn't about online at all. Uh, it's, it's a meta research about a lot of uh, psycholog psychological research. Uh, and he collected those and he came to the conclusion there were six weapons of influence. And he wrote a book about it. Um, and he did really great work. Uh, it's not just six. I'll give you that. Uh, we'll go into some others uh, later. Uh, but I'll explain those six first. Uh, and I'll uh, deep dive, uh, take a deep dive into two of them. And then we'll, uh, we'll go to see some other examples. But whatever you do, always be testing. Um, whatever you hear today, or whatever anyone else is telling you, you should do this, you should apply social proof, you should uh, apply, uh, apply authority to your website, uh, uh, hire a famous person to uh, promote your product, whatever, always be testing. We've seen a lot of results. Um, for instance, so social proof, I'll show it you, to you in a minute. Uh, if you ap apply it on one website, or even on the same website, it might have different effects on different products, so always be testing. Reciprocation is the first one from uh, Cialdini. It's actually the story I just told you um, about the homeless guy walking up to me in San Francisco. He was giving me something of value. He was adding value for me at that moment. Uh, so I wanted to do something back. You can also do that online. You can give people something of value and then uh, people, uh, you create a feeling, an uneasy feeling at that person. He wants to do something back for you. Commitment and consistency is the second one and people really like to be consistent in their behavior and you can use that uh, online and when you're going to a supermarket today and maybe you buy Pepsi, you won't be buying Coca-Cola next week and the other way around. People are consistent in their behavior and you can use that. Social proof, uh, I'll be diving in that one uh, in a few minutes. Um, social proof is about showing what others are doing, showing your Facebook, how many Facebook likes you have, for instance. Uh, authority is about, um, it's a more of a special kind of social proof. It's about the uh, certain authority, the person or the organization that is uh, uh, claiming something. Uh, you can use an, a certification to show people uh, how good you are, that you are certified developers maybe with Magento, that's authority. Liking, that's, that's uh, probably the hardest part online to get people to like you, but um, you, can, you can apply that, um, um, for instance, uh, making a more personal about page, showing who is behind your company um, and helping people to get to like you and then they'll buy easier from you and also go into a bit more into uh, scarcity scarcity is about if we if there's less of something we want it more okay uh, social proof what you can do in online you can show people how many people are following you it's really useless but people are sensitive to it uh, and you can also show if you have an app store or, or products or extensions, show reviews. That's, that's the social proof you can add to your, uh, to your site. 
This is the Magento form. They're showing how many members are on the form, are active right now, how many members do we have. If you provi provide a service, show how many people are using them and how your service is helping your customers. Show other users. Uh, you see that a lot of uh, on, on por portfolio pages. Uh, who are the other customers that are uh, using your service? Uh, Amazon example. What do other m customers ultimately buy after viewing this item? Uh, frequently bought together. Testimonials. And like I said, always be testing. We tested the uh, social proof. We uh, tested it at a bank in the Netherlands. And it was the same bank, same website, but also a bank has different products. You have products um, that you're proud of when you, when you get a new mortgage, when you get a, 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 a open a savings account. That is something that's a socially acceptable product. You can tell that to your friends, you're, you're, it's, you're okay with that. But if you have to uh, create a loan with a bank, uh, if you have to ask money to fix your refrigerator because it's broken down, if you, have, uh, if you need a loan for that, that's not something you're proud of. That's not an acceptable, socially acceptable product. So what we found out was that with socially acceptable product, we added the sentence in the past month, 30 customers bought this product. Uh, that works really well with socially acceptable products, but it doesn't work with undesirable, socially undesirable products, and it's bad for conversion. So this is why I'm saying always be testing and social proof usually is great and works, but not always. So if you have a porn site, don't use social proof. I don't want to know how many friends are watching this movie right now. Um, social proof is especially effective if you're unfamiliar with the product. Uh, if you're um, uh, really, for, ex uh, for example, into wine and you've been uh, um, re really an expert in that, you're not influenced by social proof. Um, let's see if this is working. It's a movie about uh, creating, uh, creating a movement. Um, Cuba, where's my mouse? Doesn't do mouse. It's a movie, but it's not moving. You don't have a mouse. Yeah, yeah. It's not about the sound, so that's okay. Um, this is at a festival, and this guy starts dancing. He's really having a great time, and he's showing other people that he is having a great time. And then at a certain moment, and he greets that first follower as his, it's, it's, his, it's his equal. And that first follower is really important because he shows other people how you can follow. Uh, probably some alcohol involved. Um, <laughs> I don't know. But they're, they're showing off, they're having a great time. We'll be making this vid video tonight too, right? We'll, re we'll be re recreating it, yeah. And then number three comes around and the moves, the moves really don't get any better. Um, but they're having a great time. It's really fun to be there, apparently. And at a certain point, more people join the group. They're just saying, oh, what the heck? We're just having a great time. And we don't care. We're just at a festival. Let's have some fun. Uh, let's do, do some strange dance moves. And at a certain point, people are rushing towards the group to be in their inner circle. And then at some point, you, you reach the tipping point where it's m even more weird to not be dancing than to be uh, dancing some other weird people. And people are start rushing and rushing. So that's how you create a movement. And that's social proof. Show how it works. Um, 
The second one from Cialdini I wanted to talk about was uh, scarcity. Um, probably some sites uh, uh, here in Poland doing the same thing. Um, we have Group Deal, we have uh, iBoat, we have Groupon. Uh, all sites are working on the on the idea that there's a limited supply, there's limited time, and you should act right now. Um, here there are only 20, bo 20 uh, items uh, available, and uh, here they have only a limited time left for this deal. And two days, people don't get uh, uh, in a rush, but I also work at uh, an auction website in the Netherlands. They also do hotels and uh, daily deals. And in the last 10 seconds, people really get, get crazy and the auction uh, gets, uh, I think, 80% of the bid. Um, yeah, we also tried uh, scarcity at a, at a conference once in the Netherlands. Uh, you had a, it's more of an e-commerce fair and they have breakout sessions and the breakout rooms. Uh, the breakout rooms can uh, fit, I think, about 50 people. And there are several breakout sessions at the same time, I think about eight sessions at the same time. But all the sessions are open. They're free to go to. You don't need to subscribe uh, up front for that session. But I did a session about online persuasion, so I thought, let's do it differently. So uh, what we did, we made, made it a closed session. You could only join the session if you subscribe to it up front. It was the only session that did so. Um, so regularly, 50, 30, 50 people are joining such sessions. This was my room, about 120 20 people uh, showing up. It worked. Um, another example, if you're uh, having a discount, uh, this was a discount example for an, ex an uh, experiment on uh, soup. Have a 10% uh, discount, and in version A, they uh, show the people th probably first day. They show the people there's no limit. You can buy whatever you want. Uh, don't care about the amount, uh, but you can you get a 10% discount. And the second day, they had the same uh, offer. They had a 10% discount, but you could only have 12 cans per person. That was the only difference. So on the first day. On average, people sold uh, or bought uh, uh, three cans. On the second day, on average, people bought seven cans. So actually limiting your supply uh, may increase your orders. Yeah, scarcity can be anything. It can be, uh, of course, the, the number of products you have. It can be time. It can be availability. OK, scarcity. If you go to the online presentation, I'll give you the link at the end. You can see uh, all other um, examples too. Well, um, I'll go into some fun examples uh, of our own, our own experiments. Uh, my colleague, uh, like I said, Cialdini had, had six. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, he created this uh, Wheel of Persuasion. You can find it at wheelofpersuasion.com. We have a lot more. Um, of those techniques you can apply to your uh, to your website. Um, I'm just gonna pick a b uh, pick a few out of it. Perceptual contrast and framing is about how you present your offer. Um, so imagine you're selling wine. You have three types of wine. They they look really familiar or, or similar, and um, you have an $8 wine, you have a $13 wine, and you have a $20 wine. And like, a, like I said, if you're an expert, you know what to buy. But for most people, are not wine experts, so they go to the shop. They think, well, I'm going to this party. What, which one should I buy? So most people think, well, the $8 wine, I'm not that cheap. Um, $20 wine, well, he's not that good of a friend, so... That might be a bit much. So most people choose the $13 wine. So if you're selling the wine, what should you do to make people buy the $20 wine? And people go through the same process. They think, no, I'm not cheap. I'm not going to buy the $8 wine. 
is not that good of a friend, so I'm not going to buy the $45 wine, I'll buy the $20 wine. Another example from uh, The Economist. The Economist is an online, uh, or online uh, magazine, an offline magazine. Uh, they have two versions. And they have, you can buy a web subscription, you can buy a print subscription, and you buy a, can buy a web and print subscription. And these are the conversion numbers. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising, right? Why would you buy the, the print-only subscription if you can get both for the same price? So they thought, well, if no one's buying it anyway, we might as well remove it, right? Nope. If you change the, if you change, uh, the context, uh, you change the products or the perception of the product itself. So you should be, if you have products in your catalog and that are not doing so well, be careful about removing them. It's not a nice example, like I told you, if someone says because, it's probably a good reason. Um, so the experiment, uh, the experiment is as follows. Um, um, there's a line, a big line in front of a copier, just like here, or uh, uh, um, people making copies, and there's a big line, and the student walks uh, to the first one in line, and he asks them a question to skip the line. And the first question, or the first is uh, may I use uh, may I use the copier? And in 60% of the case, which is really high in my opinion, but still in 60% of the cases, um, you walk up to the line, you ask may may I use the co copier, and the person says yes, you can may you can use the copier, and you can skip the whole line. Um, the second variant. May I use the copier because I'm in a rush? So you add a reason, and this can be a valid reason, you're in a rush, so it makes sense to skip the line and go for it. So adding the reason um, increases your chance of um, actually skipping the line. But now the, f the third one, may I use the copier because I have to make some copies? Everyone else does, um, but you're adding a reason to the question. And also remember, th the first one in line is making a decision in a split second. He's hearing a question and is ask answering quickly. In 93% of the cases, you still get to skip the line. So it helps you 1% point to have a valid reason, <laughs> but add a reason. And this is something also uh, Tom Shoes, a magenta shop in, uh, in the United States. And they also give people a reason to buy there. Why should you buy uh, at Tom's Shoes? Well, if you I buy, buy a pair of shoes at Tom's, they also give a pair of shoes to children in need. So it's a really good reason to buy there. It doesn't change my product, but it changes the reason uh, and my feeling behind it. Choice paralysis, you should, people like to, uh, to be in control. So you should give people a choice, but not too much. And the jam experiment is in the supermarket. Um, and one day they have a, a, a table with uh, six options of jam you can try, and yeah, after you can uh, buy the jam. And uh, the second day they have 24 options of jam you can try um, and can buy afterwards. So what happens? If we only look at the tasting, it's really good to have more options. 60% tries to taste uh, the jam when you have more options, and if you have less options, only 40% tries the jam. But if you're looking at buying behavior, it's a totally different story. There's so many options, I don't know what to choose. So I'll, I'm not choosing at all. I'm walking away. Um, this is Magento hosting, so which package would you like? I removed the company name. Um, give people options, not too much, and this is a much better solution. Give only four or five option packages, um, and what they did 
really great, they both did really great, was they also give you a preferred uh, selection. Even if you're in the back of the room right now, you can't read the offers. You know what is the most important or the most likely option uh, from, from both of those uh, uh, offerings. And also, like, like we learned before, the order in which we present something matters. So the, the, the one on top is a little less optimized than the one below because this one starts high. You might get a shock at first, but it only gets cheaper. And the first one starts at $19 a month and only gets more expensive. And that's a lot um, less um, nice feeling, I guess. This uh, yeah, this is Dutch, but uh, I'll explain. Um, when we when you show uh, unique selling points to customers, you can show them in a list. Um, and what we found out, green ticks really work. Um, but this is the the original version. And this is the optimized version. Um, if you give too many options, I don't know. People don't uh, don't know what's so great about your service. You have too much too many options. So we optimized it, um, and why should you, this is a hotel, hotel uh, booking site, why you should you book here? We have the lowest price guarantee. That's the main thing why you should book here. So, and then you also get these three options. And if you're still reading, we also have these options. And actually the options from left and right are exactly the same, they're just presented differently. So we had a 14% increase in conversion on the right one, in sales. And the last example is that use the census. Sh people, um, it, it's easier if you can imagine using the product. So if you're for uh, product photography, if you have, uh, um, if you sell shirts, you sell more shirts when you have actually people in them, in the pictures. Uh, it's easier to imagine how it would look on me. Uh, so the right version had 47% uh, more conversions and 67% uh, more turnover per sale. Just the only difference was uh, the pictures. Like I said, there's much, much more. Um, the wheel of persuasion, uh, you can see a lot of them. Okay, that was the biggest part of the presentation. The last part is a bit smaller. Um, where I think we'll be going uh, with e-commerce um, is behavioral targeting and pers uh, persuasional, uh, persuasive profiling. Um, we get better and better at personalization. Um, but what we do right now is um, optimizing for the average customer. Uh, if we apply social proof or authority or commitment and consistency, uh, we see a lot of uh, sites applying that site-wide to every customer on every product. And like I said, what I, I showed you for social proof, it doesn't work. It works for some products, but it doesn't work for other products. So we need to s start segmenting. Um, and there are also large uh, individual differences. Um, I might be. Um, influenced by social proof, but if you're the expert on something, you're not influenced by social proof. So there are individual differences. And in the future we will see more and more sites that dynamically um, change uh, the way to the way the, the customer is behaving. And you can also, you already can do this with uh, Magento in some part. You can have uh, segments of customers and you can change prices and uh, recommendations of products based on the behavior people are showing on the website. If, um, if you sell uh, cameras and someone is uh, putting a, a Canon camera in their shopping basket, you can let Magento show them uh, Canon accessories, for example. Um, yeah, this is one example of how to segment your customers, uh, just one way. Um, and this is how it would look different customers looking at your website and they're seeing different things. If a customer, for instance, is looking uh, more and more videos on your website, you present them more and more videos. If there's a developer on your website looking into a lot of technical details, 
you present them more and more technical details. Um, and these are some tools that can help you uh, creating a more dynamic and personalized environment. Okay, um, that's about my presentation. I want to think, say one more thing that's, again, I told you before, but always uh, test everything. And in prioritizing, um, you should have a good uh, a technological basis, a good functional basis, and then you go up to uh, usability, and then you go up to persuasion. If you have a really bad basis, then it doesn't make sense to take it to the next level and optimize for that. I once gave a workshop, online persuasion, um, and it was a subscription, so I know who was coming, and I looked at their website, and it was a big uh, insurance company in the Netherlands that were joining the, the workshop. And I was going to the website, so I typed in their website, their URL, nothing happened, a blank page. And I thought, well, this is a really big company in the Netherlands, so why should there be a bl blank page? They're probably more professional than that. So I tried with the www in front, and then it worked. So that's an example of your website can be so user-friendly or so persuasive if it's not working on a technical level or it's not providing the functionality the user wants to do, it doesn't really make sense um, to make it um, a more usable or persuasion first. So prioritize and experiment. Um, we only do, and I'm a psychologist, we use a lot of psychological research, but we don't just apply things to websites and, and products. We always test what is working, and that gives you a lot of knowledge about your customers and your products. Okay, if you want to know more about the subject, um, there are a lot of books in here. You can uh, read uh, those. Y there's also a nice uh, card deck from uh, uh, Stephen Anderson. You can use that with your team. There are a lot of uh, uh, psychological techniques in there. You can just uh, hand out some cards, take a page, and optimize that page. It's really fun to do with your, uh, with your own employees. Um, Onlinepersuasion.com, there are a lot of tips. If you want the slides from today, you go to uh, this URL. I'm very proud of this one. Um, and there's a Psychology of E-commerce blog series on my site. Um, and if you want a special treat, you can come up to front and give me your business card and we'll send you an email. Thank you very much. <laughs>